Are you struggling to conceive? You have options, and at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group, we'll make sure you have the guidance and support you need. Preg is known for individualized fertility care that's unique to every patient. We take the time to provide a reassuring and empowering experience because we believe that you deserve nothing less. Let us help you on your journey to parenthood. Visit us at pregonline.com to learn more. Get the guidance and support you need at Piedmont Reproductive Endocrinology Group. Hello, thanks for joining us on yet another edition of Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. It is great to have your company. Coming up on uh, today's show, we're going to be looking at a new way of exploring Mars. Now, we've been talking recently about helicopters. Well, they've got something else in mind, which is even more exciting, and it will get them into places they can't can't reach at the moment. And 10 years on, we are going to revisit the Higgs boson. I've got one right there. See? <laughs> there it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. 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 And we'll be oh, answering questions from uh, Patrick, Paul and Talek about passing stars, constellations and asteroids. That's all to come on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me, as he does every week without fail, well, actually, he did fail this week. That's why we're running late. But anyway, it doesn't matter because it's a, it's a podcast for a lot of people and they can listen to it at their leisure, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Good morning, Andrew or whatever time of day it is where you are. Thank you very much for that welcome. That's uh, always always a pleasure to be here and um, looking forward to our chat this morning. Yes, yes. We've got a lot to, to cover and uh, it's going to be um, rather interesting, some of these things that uh, have come up in the news of um, of late. I've got to tell you, we've, uh, we've got a bit of an emergency in town today. Uh, we've uh, been alerted by the local government that we have to boil our water for the next week. Ooh. Yes, a boil water alert. That's because of the uh, the flooding in the uh, in the region, and some of those flood waters have spread out over areas where cows go to the toilet, and <laughs> sheep and other animals. And apparently, that's caused a problem with our water supply. That um, oh dear, yeah, yeah. So we're busily boiling water. Uh, Judy's done a rush down to the supermarket to see if she can get some bottled water, but I'd say by right now, every bottle of water in town is probably gone. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's our uh, little situation this week. What what's happening in your part of the world? Well, you're absolutely right. It, there are places, certainly not very far from us, where the situation is quite dire. People yeah. who've got you know water inundation in their houses. The the rivers have broken their banks. The the amount of rainfall that we've had over the past few days has been extraordinary. We've had more than a foot in oh. four days foot of rain 30 millimeter 30 centimeters um and we're okay here in the bit of sydney we live in because it's very hilly and so the water just runs down the hills and ends up somewhere else but certainly those people who've been you know they've had inundation in their houses and it's it's the third time this year yeah, that's the absolute tragedy they've just cleaned up yeah, cleaned up from the last time and sure enough here it comes again yeah it's been horrible it's i don't yeah. recall such a, a longitudinal wet period like it's been it's been raining for a couple of years now basically yes we've been in a lengthy um la nina event here mm. in australia eastern australia and it's not going away apparently so well apparently <laughs> the, the la nina is officially not in existence at the moment but they've forecast it will come back yeah yeah so i believe so uh yes i did hear one report suggesting that we could be getting another two years worth of rain it's <laughs> And, and our, next, our local dam, which is five times bigger than Sydney Harbour, just 70 k's down the road from me, which supplies us, it jumped 20% in three days. Wow. I know. That's, that's a lot of water. Extraordinary yeah, that's, amount of water. That's uh, Burundong Dam, isn't it? Yeah, Burundong, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a lovely spot. Massive, massive dam. It is huge. Yeah, yeah. Now, we best get down to business, Fred. Let's uh, go to our first story. Now, we have been talking in recent times about the uh, the rovers on Mars doing their thing, trying to find you know 
evidence of past life on the planet and the Ingenuity helicopter has been doing missions which have been proving very, very successful but also helpful in the in the search for, for these um, pieces of evidence. But there are parts of Mars we cannot go and there might be information in those places and so uh, they've come up with a new idea that might get us access to some of the um, atmospheric regions of the planet which i find ex- extremely exciting i love this concept it's great isn't it i think so too and it's a giant um, ladder by the way it's a <laughs> yeah so this is a story out of uh, principally the university of arizona their uh, aerospace and mechanical engineering section the reason we're talking about it is because of the publication of a paper in the journal aerospace whose title is and gives the game away Mars exploration using sailplanes yes. uh, and the uh, authors come from as I said aerospace and mechanical engineering department in University of Arizona and NASA Ames as well Mountain View in California so here's the here's the, the lowdown uh, what we have with ingenuity is yes a helicopter that has been taken to Mars by Perseverance was expected to have five flights and um, you know check, demonstrate that flying on Mars was possible. We so far we've had twenty nine flights, yes. which have been very very successful. The thing is, ingenuity the device itself has worked perfectly and demonstrated what an asset it is. You know, when you've got a rover on Mars, it's demonstrated how good it is to get just a few meters up into the air to look and see what's beyond the next rock or horizon or whatever mm. so ingenuity is is pretty basic it's just got cameras on board i think there are two and it's solar panels and it's rotors and a bit of intelligence built into it because it has to fly autonomously um but what it can't do is take atmospheric samples it can't sort of sense the temperature or any of those things that's all done by perseverance in this case yep. but the thinking behind the, you know the new story today is the atmosphere of mars has a lot to tell us about the planet, the interaction between its surface geology and the atmosphere. And it, wouldn't it be great if you could get just a bit higher up, <laughs> you know, up to a few tens or maybe even a couple of thousand metres mm-hmm. above the surface? That might be a bit ambitious. You might run out of air altogether up there. But that's what's led to this proposal to fly sailplanes in the atmosphere of Mars, gliders. Yeah. Uh, and the there's a lovely image which um, is accompanying the article of actually the author, lead author of the paper, Adrian Buschella. He's an engineering doctoral student, and he and uh, uh, one of his professors is holding this beautiful, stunning sailplane with a long, slender wing, what we call a high aspect ratio wing, which is the kind of thing that I think they're envisaging that you might fly in the atmosphere of Mars with festooned with you know sensors so that you can pick up all these bits of information about the composition of the atmosphere on Mars, about its pressure and temperature and all the other parameters, the humidity, which is very, very low. The so, so that that you know prospect of having having gliders fl- floating around Mars over the next couple of decades or so is really an exciting one. The question that arose in my mind pretty well straight away is how do you how do you launch something like that? Yeah, uh, giant you know. rubber band, I suppose. <laughs> well, that's right. That's the standard technique. You know, for I mean, I remember flying gliders exactly with that a giant yeah. rubber band to get it up into the air when. I- the kid and of course a lot of gliding enthusiasts they 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 get a tow up from either a, either a tow aircraft or a or a land based winch but don't have either of those on mars for for a robotic sailplane so what they're thinking of doing and it's in the abstract of the paper it's you know basically um, uh, it's summarized that the idea Actually, I'm going to read directly from the abstract. The absence of a propulsion system allowing for a compact form factor means the sailplanes can be packaged into CubeSats and deployed as secondary payloads at relatively low cost, providing scientific data over locations inaccessible by current landers and rovers. Yet various sailplane deployment methods are considered, 
including rapid deployment during entry, descent and, sorry, entry, descent and landing of a Mars Science Laboratory class vehicle. That's one like Perseverance. And deployment using a blimp. There's another one. Oh. You know, you have a, an airship to lift your sailplane up and send it away. And I should just mention, Andrew, the real crux of their argument here is that glider pilots know if you choose your, your, traje- your flight path so that you maximize the, the ability to soar on thermals and things of that sort, you can an- actually end up going a very, very long way indeed mm. just with a glider and, you know, sort of gaining, gaining energy, gaining height as you go, as you go um, further and further. And the paper draws comparison between the way albatrosses fly because that's what they do they go they, for yeah they glide they just they just glide yeah. and updrafts and they can stay up for days yeah without one flap of the wings yeah. and that's good because the glider can't flap its wings so what they say is and again c- quoting from the abstract numerical results for complete dynamic soaring cycles demonstrated that the total sailplane energy at the end of a soaring cycle increases by 6.8 to 11 percent in other words if you, if you do things right you are you wind up you know basically with more energy than you than you had to start with more in, and that really means height i guess in this in this yeah. context that's fantastic yeah, it and is fantastic yeah i suppose that means they'd be autonomous it'd be yeah, kind of in the lap of the gods in in many respects so uh, they'd be subject to the the conditions that they faced at the time but they would also uh, be able to collect data and transmit it back to a base station of some kind probably yes, on a road and or maybe that, a, yeah, maybe an orbiting space. Yeah, car. maybe, yeah. and then then that gets transmitted back to Earth, and we can get almost real time data about what's happening in the atmosphere of Mars. That's yeah. that's really exciting because I read the article too, and basically it's an area we don't know much about. It's yes, been untouchable. We've gone through it, but we haven't stopped to go. Hey, this looks interesting. No, too late. Oh, no. <laughs> So th- yeah. this is a way of actually getting up into those uh, areas of the atmosphere that we generally pass through at speed. <laughs> yes, that's that's right. It's that you know you're on descent, coming down from orbit, and so uh, that's right. The the uh, it's an area of Mars's atmosphere that's you know there's enough known about it to successfully use aero braking for a spacecraft coming in from earth yeah uh, that's that's good but the details are certainly not known um i like the the, the idea as well that these scientists have thought of this idea and developed it they're actually preparing to do some experiments with sailplanes actually on earth but at much much greater heights than you normally fly sailplanes just so that you get the the you know in the sort of, of the replica atmosphere. of mars the thinness of the atmosphere that's yeah. right up to fifteen thousand feet wow. that's four and a half kilometers so yeah that's where atmospheric conditions are most like the the ones that uh, you find on Mars. Makes me wonder, though, if, like the helicopter, they had to redesign it for a for Mars atmosphere because it's so thin, they had to make the rotors rotate at, at much higher revolutions yeah. to achieve lift. Will they have to redesign gliders for Mars atmosphere compared to the way they would operate on a, on, on Earth? And, and that, yeah. Yeah, therein lies the tests at high altitude. That's right. And I think you're right. I mean, from you know the little I've seen of the imagery of this, it looks as though the kind of gliders that are being thought of have got really very high aspect ratio wings, very long, long and slender wings almost actually mimicking the shape of the rotors on, on Ingenuity, yes. which are you know wider than normal helicopter rotors but and have this long, slender shape to them. So, yes, my guess is that exactly as you said, the design of, um, of sailplanes for use on Mars will be quite different from what you would find here on Earth. And uh, I, I would imagine that they, they'd have a, a short mission life. I, how long would they stay up there? Well, <laughs> how long does an albatross stay up there? <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, so I think um, I think that you know the the idea behind this is to give them quite a long life. It might it might not be infinitely long, but long enough to get good data and um, get that over a over a range of locations. So yeah, these things flying around Mars m- might might give us much more information about the atmosphere. Takes me back to school when I was in uh, year six, and a friend of mine. Still a friend today. G'day, Phil. He, um, he came into class one day. 
with a secret new paper plane design. Oh. And we, uh, we made a few of these and he decided to test one in class with the teacher's back turned <laughs> and gained altitude very quickly. It leveled off near the ceiling just as the teacher turned around. It went past the teacher's head, did a complete circumnavigation of the classroom and then turned, <laughs> wait for it. I'm not kidding. This is a true story. And then it turned back and landed on Phil's desk. Oh, that's extraordinary. Guess who got uh, the cane? <laughs> yeah. Did he now? Yeah. He did. Got the cane. Oh, wow. Yeah, he oh, got wow. caught by his own invention. <laughs> Dear me, yes, which which came back and said, it was him, it was him. It was probably up there for a good 15 seconds, which, you know, wow. in a classroom scenario with a paper aeroplane is pretty impressive. I should give his name and number to NASA <laughs> or the University of Arizona and see yes, if he can help. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I still make that design today for my grandchildren. They think it's amazing. Okay, mm. and it's different from the standard, is it? Oh, much different, yes. Oh, very oh, um, oh. very boxy-shaped thing. I could make machine. one and show you right now if you like. Uh, you'll have to show I'll, us. I'll yeah, do I'll it during the break. All right, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's, that's, a, that's a good plan. But, yes, yeah, so, so no uh, timeline on when this might happen? No, because it's going to depend on, you know, fitting this sort of thing into a future mission. But it is interesting that they've considered how you get it to Mars and they're basing it on the model of a of an, L, an MSL class, that's Mars Science Laboratory class of, of Rover, which is Perseverance and Curiosity. They're both, they're both uh, that. In fact, Curiosity wasn't known as Mars Science Laboratory for a while. Mm. So, yeah, uh, maybe, you know, I think we're talking on a decade time scale, Andrew, but you know, it's still, it's still, uh, so it's early days yet, but it is still very exciting. <laughs> yeah, and not overly expensive by the sound of it, which is even that's better. right. It mm. would be, yes, it will be an inexpensive mission. Yeah. yeah, maybe they can wait till we send people to Mars and they can just chuck it out the <laughs> window it, on with the way a rubber band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, well, hopefully we'll have more to talk about in this. Um, uh, in the not too distant future. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Sponsor, let's take a little break from the show to tell you about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and it's basically a way of insulating you against people who might want to get into your personal data. Nord is the best in the business. They've been at this for a long time. They know the trade they are better than anybody. They also have the fastest servers in the VPN world. And they make your online data unreadable to others, whether that's hackers or maybe governments or whoever is trying to get your private information. Uh, long story short, they protect your online activity. Now, as a Space Nuts listener, there is a special deal available to you to get hold of NordVPN. But right now, there's something else that you might want to take advantage of. Uh, it, it depends on which package you, you buy. There are certain um, security packages available through NordVPN. You can get the standard package, which gives you secure high-speed VPN, malware protection, and uh, a, a tracker and ad blocker. But if you go up to the intermediate level, uh, that's called um, the plus standard, uh, it gives you a couple of extras, including a cross-platform password manager and a data breach scanner. Or if you just want to spend a little bit more and get absolute security on a two-year plan, the complete package also adds one terabyte of encrypted cloud storage. You get the lot. Uh, now, as a Space Nuts listener, you can get that two-year plan uh, at a very low price. And all you have to do is log into the special URL, URL that's been set up, nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Uh, and then use the code space nuts to get your discounted uh, offer, no matter what level you choose. Uh, check it all out on that special URL and then just click on the um, grab the deal uh, button to look at all the options available through the various plans with our sponsor, NordVPN. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts and use the code word space nuts for a special discounted deal for you as a space nuts listener. Now, back to the show. Roger, you're live, you're also. Space nuts.
Now, Fred, uh, it's been a bit of a celebration this week. I've certainly heard it mentioned in the news, and that is the 10th anniversary of the experiment that revealed the Higgs boson. And it was sort of a, um, a, a red-letter day in particle physics because it, it was something that was known in theory yeah. and had been known since the middle of last century. But then they, uh, they, they basically pushed a button on the Large Hadron Collider and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Oh, look, <laughs> it's a Higgs boson. What do we do with it now? Oh, hang on, I've dropped it. <laughs> Where did it go? Um, <clears throat> let's, let's sort of start at the very start. Uh, and talk about what the Higgs boson actually is before we talk about the 10 years of research since. Yeah. So um it takes its name from Peter Higgs, who is still a theoretical physicist, professor emeritus in the University of Edinburgh and Nobel Prize winner for his work on, on this sort of thing. So back in the 1960s, Peter Higgs realised that our understanding of you know what's called the standard model uh, um, of particles, the, the fact that we think there are four fundamental forces that are understood by particle physics, the electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear force, and gravity. Gravity, sadly, doesn't yet have, have a particle physics explanation for it, but those are the, the fundamental forces of nature. Um, so he realised that there was something missing here and that... There must be, he you get into the weirdness of quantum physics, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, there must be a field that permeates the universe that's everywhere, uh, some sort of field that is required to explain how those subatomic particles behave. And when you've got a field, you can also interpret that as being due to particles. So it's like, you know, we, we think of, and we don't know what they are yet because we've never identified them, but gravitons as being the particles that are associated with the gravitational field. So he figured that there would be something called the Higgs field, naturally, after his name, mm -hmm. and postulated that it would have an associated subatomic particle. And let's go and find it. So that was in the mid-1960s. And it took until, you know, as we've mentioned, 2012 before it was found. I actually had the great opportunity of doing it. It was a 60 minutes segment that I did actually at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland the year before it was discovered. So it was all focused on the Big Bang and whether you know there was this missing entity, the Higgs particle. And I remember we interviewed some physicists there and um, you know, but the question was, when do you think the Higgs particle is gonna be found? As I said, this was the year before, it was I think September 2011. And one person said, within the next year. And mm -hmm. the rest of the physicists all looked at, looked at him and said, really? No, you can't believe that. It's not nowhere near the yeah, next go year. Go back to being paper planes, man. Yeah, yeah. And sure enough, though, within a year it turned up. And so the key thing about the Higgs boson is that it's the particle that endows all the other particles with mass. Uh, which leads to that classic joke, which I'm sure we've recited already on, on this show, Andrew, and I think you know what it is. A Higgs boson goes into a church and the priest says, I'm sorry, we don't let Higgs bosons into this church. And the Higgs boson says, well, how do you have mass? That's, <laughs> the, that's the old Higgs boson joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very yeah. nice one too. The, so anyway, the... the Discovery, 4th of July was when it was announced uh, in 2012. It's a discovery that was quite unequivocal. You know, there's no doubt about it. That was the Higgs boson being found. And it's, it's actually a, a nice little video clip, which I found on uh, on uh, our favourite website, fizz.org. But... Um, it's just, if you Google 10th anniversary of Higgs boson discovery, that'll take you to this six minute clip that really um, gives some lovely views of the announcement when it was made, because of course it was made to great fanfare with oh, media, yes. all sorts of media presence. But it was a result that came from two different detectors, Large Hadron Collider, which that giant atom smasher sitting, straddling actually the boundary between uh, France and Switzerland not far from Geneva, that, um, that is the machine that was used to discover the Higgs boson and to verify the results 
beyond any doubt. Of so course, the big political argument that came out of it is wh- which side of the border the yeah, on yeah. actually <laughs> manifested itself. So the French are saying, hang on, it was us and you can't yeah. call it champagne. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway, in fact, actually, the um, I don't know whether you know this, Andrew, but the border it kind of weaves through the – so it's a 27-kilometre-long tunnel, a ring, yep. under, underground, and it crosses the border several times. So I think, think it's – nature of the border. Yeah, I think it's four times it goes across it. So, you know, these particles, French – oh, no, they're not the Swiss. Oh, no, the French. Oh, no, sorry, Swiss. No, no. It probably uh, happened everywhere at the same time. Um, more or less. Actually, because these things are travelling at – now, let me get this right. I think I can remember the number. It's 99.99998% of the speed of light. <laughs> wow, that's pretty close. It's pretty close, that's right. Yeah. Do, do we know what it represents, though, the Higgs boson? Do we know – what its function was. Yes. I mean, when it first was announced, somebody, some clever sub-editor or somewhere referred to it as the God particle. Yeah, that's right. In fact, actually, that, that um, goes back long beyond, long before the announcement. Does it? People, yeah. I think that was, let me see if I can find a reference to that. I think that um, that expression was coined actually in the uh, in 1993. There you are. Oh, there you are. Uh, Okay, it was in a book by uh, Leon Lederman and Dick Teresi. They called it the God Particle uh, mm-hmm. because what they were, the point they were making was the crucial role that the Higgs boson plays in our standard model of physics. And it is exactly what we've just said it's how other particles acquire mass. And so the yes, the, the, um, you know, the nature of the Higgs boson is crucial. And that is why. You know why? What sixty years of effort went into actually discovering it and finding it yeah. from the nineteen sixties to twenty twelve? The the really interesting, you know, it's really interesting the mechanism by which you observe the Higgs boson because they, as you know, in the Large Hadron Collider, you wind up these protons to the speed I just mentioned, nearly the speed of light. You have two beams going in opposite directions and at several places around the rim of the collider, you bring them together to collide. And it's the Atlas and compact muon solenoid experiments which were where the Higgs boson was discovered. But so what happens is these things collide, but the Higgs boson is very elusive. For a start, for every billion collisions between protons you only get one higgs boson being created wow uh, and then decays stupendously quickly into other particles so you you don't really see the higgs boson you just see its consequences in terms of what it's decayed into yeah and so it's by measuring what these particles are telling you that you can work out and confirm the, the existence of the higgs boson itself mm. but, no. Have they found any other subatomic particles in the 10 years since? Yes, there, there are, have been others found, but not not as fundamental as the Higgs boson. There, are, there right. are other new particles. And, of course, work is continuing because, as you and I have discussed many times, our theory of fundamentals of nature is, is inadequate because, for a start, we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. We know that gravity would have to have its quantum equivalents, the gravitons, Mm. but they've never been discovered. And things like, I mean, the astronomers provide one of the the routes into trying to understand nature at its most fundamental because we don't have an explanation yet for dark matter. We we know that there's there's massive subatomic particles. We, well, we, we believe that that is the most likely explanation, that there are massive subatomic particles uh, which not seen in the colliders and the large hadron collider has been tuned up to look for something called supersymmetry which is the idea that every subatomic particle has a kind of shadow particle perhaps existing in a different dimension which is supersymmetrical and more massive and it's thought that possibly if this supersymmetry theory is correct maybe dark matter is one or maybe even more than one species of these supersymmetric particles the axion and the neutralino are the two that have been have been mentioned even though we don't know that these things exist yeah so a lot of the work of the lhc is looking for cracks in 
uh, you know, in our, in our understanding that would lead to exploring the possible new physics that might reveal where these other particles are lying. Actually, I have to say that supersymmetry has sort of gone off the boil a bit because there's been no sign of it at all in anything that's done at the Large Hadron Collider. That there are some little curiosities that are emerging from work done there and at other particle accelerators which actually concern the the weak electro um, sorry the weak atomic the weak nuclear force um the w and z bosons which carry the weak nuclear force there's some little oddities uh, that are showing up fairly consistently in the way they behave and so i think that's sort of where things are going at the moment meanwhile the large hadron collider itself is i think it's just started in fact it may even be today that they switch it on yeah i knew uh, it was coming up yeah no actually it's a couple of days ago what they call run three which is something following a three-year shutdown to upgrade its accelerator and its experiments and that started a couple of days ago will run till the end of 2025 mm -hmm. And we'll get new new collisions at a, a higher energy, 13.6 tera electron volts, to be precise. Wow. So are you anticipating another big breakthrough in the future from the Large Hadron Collider? Really interesting question, because I go through my life thinking, yeah, you know, something could pop out the woodwork any time. Yeah. <laughs> and it might be to do with, as we were saying, the, you know, these little oddities that are showing up with the... Um, weak nuclear force so let's wait and see i yeah. i'm never what happens i think andrew is uh, if something like you know a big discovery like this is coming up something equivalent to the higgs you start getting leaks of bits of information coming from the physics world and sometimes that's picked up by the the media sometimes it's not but those leaks often you know a time when people start getting it it's a bit like the leaks that came up when when we knew that there was going to be a an image released a couple of months ago of the black hole at the center of our galaxy sagittarius a star yeah. uh, there were there were media announcements put out forewarnings that made it pretty clear what it was that we're going to be talking about without actually mentioning it you know a big discovery from the event horizon telescope concerning the milky way galaxy well that tells you exactly what <laughs> what it is even though they weren't actually announcing that yes indeed uh, and the same happens in physics as well mm. well i often find working in the media that uh, the the newsworthiness of a story like a, a particle being discovered by the large hadron collider team comes down to whether or not people will understand the story when yeah, it's that's right. that's published right. because sometimes yeah. the complexity of a story kills it. Yeah. And yeah. unless they can simplify it into plain English, they sometimes just go, nah, too hard, put it in the too hard basket. But, you know, people with those sorts of interests can certainly read the scientific papers when they're published, which is probably the <laughs> the best way to, to go with it. It is. Like if you yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to understand a particle <laughs> physics paper if I read it. No, <laughs> no. Well, I certainly couldn't. Yes. Yeah. All right, but uh, more to come with the um, with the, the winding up of the Large Hadron Collider again as we speak. For this is Space years. Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. There. Space Nuts. Question time, Fred. This is where the audience <laughs> sends us questions and we don't answer them very well. But um, we've got some really good ones today and I I think we'll just get straight into it because they're fairly self-explanatory. But they, there's a few of them, a couple of them here that I've, yeah, I don't think we've ever discussed before, particularly this first one from Patrick. Hi, Fred and Andrew. This is Patrick from Centennial, Colorado in the United States. I have a question about stars that have and will pass through our solar system. I was reading an article recently about a star called Schultz star that they believe passed through the outer Oort cloud some 70,000 years ago. My question is, what are the chances that any Oort cloud objects that may have been perturbed by the passage of the star could be now heading into the inner solar system sometime in the future? Secondly, it's believed that Gliese 710 will pass roughly within 10,000 AU of the Sun in the future. With Gliese 710 being a much more massive star than Schultz's star, what are the chances that this passage could send or cloud objects or even Kuiper Belt objects 
um, into the inner solar system. Thanks for taking my questions, and thanks for having the best astronomy podcast in the entire solar system. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. Actually, it's the only uh, podcast of its kind in the solar system, so yeah. But no, appreciate the support. I'm a bit confused by his question because I don't understand the concept of stars passing through our solar system. Does he mean solar system or galaxy or outside no, our it, solar system? No, he means the solar system. But oh. we're, to we're talking about, you know, the solar system on its on its widest scale. Because so out way beyond the... Yeah, way beyond the planets. Yeah. So the, you know, we've got um, uh, the Oort cloud there, which is probably something like 10 or 15, maybe 20% of the distance to the nearest star. It's so big. Mm. Uh, we're, we're talking about this shell of, of cometary nuclei. And uh, that's, that's the, you know, the, di the dimensions of that and the kind of distance that Schultz star is thought to have passed by are much, much bigger than the dimensions of the planetary system. So what's Neptune 30 astronomical units, if I remember rightly, one astronomical unit being the distance between the Earth and the Sun, yeah. 150 million kilometres. So we're talking now about tens of thousands of astronomical units. So much, much further away, but still gravitationally bound to the Sun. So still in a sense part of the solar system. And yeah, it's a Good point that Patrick raises, and you're quite right. We re really haven't discussed this before. So Schultz's star, actually discovered by somebody I, I've certainly talked to rather than worked with, Ralph Dieter Schultz of the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysic Potsdam, usually called the IAP, the um, Astro Astrophysical Institute of Potsdam in Germany, not far from Berlin. Now, I've worked a lot there because the uh, RAVE survey that I was involved with, uh, looking at the speeds of stars, that was led from that exact institute. And so we went to many meetings and conferences there. And Ralph Dieter is somebody I'm pretty sure I've spoken to in the past. So he found this star, which has, uh, in fact, it's not just a star, it's a binary star. So there's a red dwarf which is much smaller than the sun, and a brown dwarf, which is smaller still, wow. which are actually in the southern constellation of Monoceros. Beg your pardon, the northern constellation of Monoceros, the unicorn, currently at a distance of about 20 light years. But it's the velocity of that star, its trajectory. When you track back, uh, you see that it actually was in our vicinity Quite recently, in, in astronomical time, 70,000 years ago, the suggestion is that it passed within about 50,000 astronomical units of the sun. And it's, you know, it, it's very close. That's sort of typical of the kind of distance that the Oort cloud is at. Mm. So, um, so, so as Patrick's question is, is on the money, because... If you tip something out of the Oort cloud, it takes something in the region of 100,000 years to get here. Wow. So something has been disturbed by the passage of, of uh, Schultz's star could be on its way. Um, fortunately, we might have 30,000 years before it gets here. <laughs> but yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent suggestion. It could be stuff incoming already that results from this, from this cloud passage and, and 30, certainly 30,000 30, years to get here 30 minutes before we realize it <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> exactly Some, sometimes not that much <clears throat> no yeah but certainly the thinking in terms of um you know the periodic bombardment that we've had over the earth's history from comets and things and this goes back to work with people who i did work with actually at the uh, royal observatory in edinburgh yeah. uh, victor victor Klub and bill napier who were among the first to suggest that has been bombarded episodically by comets and probably asteroids as well. So when you when you do the analysis, you can see these periods of, of increased bombardment. It usually comes from cratering records and things of that sort. And is interpreted as being the Oort cloud being disturbed by something like a passing star or a passing giant molecular cloud, which are the birthplaces of stars. So the material 
all these things, the stars, the sun, and everything go around the center of our galaxy. It's sort of swirling around in their individual orbits around the center of the galaxy. Phil's so paper plane. Stuff. Phil's paper plane could cause a disturbance <laughs> in the Oort cloud. Well, it certainly caused a disturbance on his backside, I think, from what you've He told got it me. on the hand. The cane. Well, he got it on the hand. When I got the when I got the cane, I got it on the backside. No, I broke his thumb. Very sore. Did it? Mm. Yes. Ooh, you couldn't get away with that these days. Punishment back then. Oh yeah. my God! Broke his no, thumb. No, did broke his thumb. Oh yep. dear. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so Patrick's right though. Is what he's saying. He is, yeah. Right. Yes, he's right. And actually, he also mentioned uh, Gliese seven ten, which is another star which is expected to to make a passage near the sun. Uh, in a bit longer, one one and a third million years down the track, but that's going to be even closer. It'll be about ten thousand astronomical units, and it's a much more massive star as well. It's not, you know, a red dwarf or a brown dwarf. So mm. that does suggest that perhaps in our very distant future there might be trouble ahead for for our distant descendants because of inbound objects from the Oort cloud. Fantastic. Not fantastic, but fantastic question. Thank it's you, Patrick. a fantastic question. Yeah, it's bad and, news, but a fantastic yeah. question. <laughs> and, and thanks for the vote of confidence. I'm going to do a bit of a switcheroo on the questions because sort of Patrick may well have answered Tarlik's question. Tarlik <laughs> Island has asked a, a question about yeah. asteroid danger. So I'm going to leap forward to that Fine. using the Higgs boson method. And <laughs> here we go. Hi, Andrew and Fred. My name is Tarlik, listening from Dublin in Ireland. Heard your call for questions in episode 309, so I figured, what the heck, I'll ask. The worst thing that happens is it won't be answered. <laughs> I was recently listening to episode 308 in the back garden, talking about 40% of asteroids not being identified when I saw a shooting star, which briefly, briefly burned brighter than a plane approaching Dublin Airport in the twilight sky. Episode 306 spoke about Asteroid uh, 7335 JA, which was a relatively close uh, approach in astronomical terms. I know the Earth moves at 30k second on its orbit and has removed many dangerous objects with historic impacts. Also, where based on the surface of the Moon, there's an estimate of 60 impact objects of about 5k or greater in the last 600 million years. The late Stephen Hawkins considered an asteroid impact to be the biggest threat to civilization. My question is this Does the scientific community expect that this historic average rate of impacts to continue in the long term? Or is the prevailing thinking we're on the downslope of a bell curve in terms of the likelihood of a large and potentially hazardous, hazardous impact? Love the show. Found the podcast at the beginning of the COVID lockdowns in 2020. Been hooked since. Thanks a million. <laughs> Thank you, Tarlik. Um, great yeah. question. I think Patrick may have given him a hint as to where the future lies. That, that, well, that's right. Yeah. So, in fact, Patrick's right as well, though, because, uh, you know, when you think of asteroid impacts in particular, what you're seeing there is impacts by the debris that's left around from the formation of the solar system this is the just just the localized debris. junk it's junk and it, it's it's not it's not spread evenly throughout the solar system because we know jupiter being so massive has sort of shepherded a lot of these asteroids into the asteroid belt and there's also yeah. the outer asteroid belt the kuiper yeah. belt but the bottom line is what we're seeing is the la the last vestiges of planet formation because planets are formed by things hitting one another and sticking together and so in that sense talak is right we're seeing you know we're on the downward slope of a bell curve because because 4.6 billion well actually about 4 billion years ago there was huge activity everything was crashing into everything else it's what we call the late heavy bombardment and then things gradually tailed off and they're continuing to tail off but not a level that we could ever measure because you know it's over human time scales it's it's the same as it was a million years ago but but then exactly as patrick's question alluded to superimposed on that things that sort of external influences like the gravitational tug of a star passing close to the solar system which could you know, can upset the apple cart because you have still got this reservoir of stuff that hasn't been used. And actually, yeah. I think Patrick did suggest, or it's, it's stuff that hasn't hit the earth yet, if I can put it that way. Patrick suggested that if things got really bad, it could be Kuiper Belt objects that are hitting, coming into the inner solar system and, and you know, potentially, um, potentially dangerous, as well as comets. And that's a very good point as well. So, yes, so two great questions and well done for 
juxtaposing them there because they're entirely interrelated. Yes, so what we've are. got is, sorry, just going to say what we've got is this gradual easing off of the planet formation process, but superimposed on that are bumps in, in the distribution caused by things going past in the outer past the outer solar system like other stars yeah other stars fascinating and thanks Tarlik. lovely to hear from you and hope things are well in ireland i played golf with an irishman on wednesday he transferred from the army in the uk to the australian army and he's now running the reserve here in in dubbo nice good. bloke too terrible golfer go. but nice bloke <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, to our final question, and this is one we haven't had before, from Paul. G'day, Fred and Andrew. It's Paul here from Brisbane in Queensland, home of the Mighty Maroons. Uh, I have a quick question about the way that constellations are represented on paper. Uh, the usual way to do it these days seems to be the geometrical pattern, uh, the geometrical method, rather, and that's all great for serious astronomers and scientists, obviously, uh, but they kind of make it a bit hard for me to visualise in the night sky. Uh, Picasso would have loved them, I'm sure. But, Fred, I remember you redrew a few of them in Space Warp, and uh, they looked really cool. And back in the 1950s or 60s, H.A. Ray uh, did a whole book called uh, A New Way to See the Stars, where he drew all the constellations in a way that kind of, well, makes sense so that, you know, Virgo actually looks like a woman and so on and so forth. I'm just wondering if we can't make his way of doing things and yours uh, more of a standard thing for, uh, you know, school kids, ordinary people, that kind of thing, and leave the geometrical patterns for um, the more, how can I put it, uh, scientifically inclined among us. Anyway, um, I hope you're all doing well. Certainly, that includes uh, you, Hugh. I uh, certainly hope you're doing better than me with this little bit of flu that I have. Cheers. Uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, commiserations. On... <laughs> Paul was referring to a, a football team, <laughs> Queensland Maroons. Every year, for those overseas that don't know what he's talking about, every year, the states of Queensland and New South Wales face off in a three-match series called the State of Origin, and it's a rugby league game where our guys play against their guys, best of three wins the series. It's probably the pinnacle of the game. It's probably bigger than playing against other nations. The rivalry between New South Wales and Queensland is well documented. This all started back in the 80s, and New South Wales gave Queensland a, a real dust-up the other day uh, to level the series at one all, and next week we play the decider. Unfortunately, we're playing in Brisbane, so I'm not I'm not putting money on the game. It's uh, it'll be too close to call, but um, that's why I gave him a raspberry. Uh, thank, <laughs> thanks, so Paul. Good to hear from you. Uh, yeah, drawing constellations. You've done this, Fred. Yes, I have. Yeah, that's right. Look, it's a great question, and actually, I'm indebted to Paul for drawing my attention to this book, which is one I didn't know about. I okay. got a keen interest in in old astronomy books but yes it's a book was called the stars a new way to see them written by h.a ray published in 1952 revised in 1962 and again updated in 1997 so it's had uh, various editions actually and came about because of exactly what paul was talking about uh, uh he the author h.a ray was interested in astronomy and he you know, like the star and sorry, like the stars and looked at them, but he found the constellations hard to remember because yeah. of the shapes. That, you know, as I've said, actually, it says in Space Warp, many of them, most of them don't look like what they're supposed to be. These are the join the dot patterns that we're talking about. So he redrew them in a way that they are often portrayed today in the way that H.A. Uh, Ray redrew them. So Something that just gives you a bit more of an insight, the lines between the stars that make more of a relevant shape for whatever these constellations are supposed to be. So um, that's great for star watchers. And yes, I did my bit in, what was it, improved constellations in Space War. But uh, the, what Paul referred to as the geometrical uh, descriptions of the constellations, what that means is the, the boundaries 
of between constellations which are delineated by uh, almost legislation it's the international astronomical union which is the governing body of astronomy and back in 1922 that was when those constellations first of all the constellations were kind of um, adopted formally rather than just being loose loose you know, loose connections of stars. They were adopted formally in 1922, and the boundaries between them were drawn. And they usually follow lines of either right ascension or declination, which are the same as latitude and longitude on Earth. So it's it's kind of analogous to the way we refer to countries on the surface of the Earth. Like if you think of, you know, a continent, which is composed of many different countries, such as Europe, uh, those those countries have their boundaries. And as soon as you say something like oh, it's in Germany or it's in Northern Ireland or wherever, you know what bit of the sky you're talking about. Sorry, what bit of the earth you're talking about. And the same is true now with these constellation boundaries that the IAU put together. So if you say it's in Virgo or, or Leo or Gemini, then you know which bit of the sky exactly precisely you're looking at because they've got these boundaries between them which are like you know international boundaries so mm. from the technical point of view of the working professional astronomer it's very important to have those geometrical boundaries even though that they themselves are quite arbitrary they just relate to our particular viewpoint from where we are in the galaxy and what stars we see that they don't have any physical meaning at all they just help to define the area of sky that you're looking at so, look, I'm a big fan of the idea behind the stars, A New Way to See Them, H.A. Ray's book, because I think the more you can do to improve people's memories of what constellations look like, the better it is. And I see there's different editions. There's a, a children's edition, which was called okay. Find the Constellations, which is still in print. So it's something that people can go out and have a look at. I'm going to start searching for a copy of uh, the original book, though, if I can. The stars, a new way to see them. I'll have a look on the web and see if I can find a copy. Beauty. Thank you, Paul. And I wish you no luck at the football next week. Um, got a comment from Ollie on YouTube, YouTube who says, I guess in fairness there are apps these days like Stellarium yeah. that show yeah. the nice constellations artwork yeah, if that's a way that you want to see it. And another comment saying that um, he uses a sky map. So there are other options. Yes, but, um, yes, that's right. Yeah. The apps are great, you know, on your phone. Oh, yeah. I've got one. It's a freebie, so it's not the most sophisticated one, but I think it's Skyview I, I, I use. And uh, I think yeah. I use the same one. Yeah, mm. and it's great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Just such a novel use of the technology, of the fact that the phone's got accelerator, accelerometers in it, so you know which way up it is and which way it's pointing, yeah. and you've got GPS in it, so it knows exactly where on the planet you are. It's, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you to everyone who sent in questions. We got a whole swag of them this week, so we'll work our way through those over the coming episodes. And yeah, thanks, Fred, uh, for all your input. Uh, really pleasure. covered some amazing ground this week, so much appreciated. <laughs> and looking forward to catching up with you next time. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. Take care. Get rid of that COVID and we'll, we'll all be good. <laughs> yeah. It's the plan. Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And just a reminder too, if you want to catch up with us online, you can do that through Facebook where we have an official page or the podcast group, which is a user-generated Facebook page. Just do a search for Space Nuts. You'll find them both. If you want to send us questions, do it via our website, spacenutspodcast.io or space Not spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. There you are. And you can send us questions there. And um, don't forget to leave us some reviews because reviews are very helpful to grow our audience. And you can uh, also do reviews via Spotify now on Android devices, which you haven't been able to do in the past, but you can now. So there's another option for you. And if you want to look into becoming a patron, you can do that on our website as well. Well, that uh, wraps it up. Just one more go with this paper plane, Fred, I think. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. See if I can get it to do a loop. Well, no, it's stalled. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's it from us. Thanks for your company. We'll catch you again on the next edition of Space Nuts. Bye bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from bytes.com. See if I can remember how to make one of these things. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Take a can. standard piece of A4 paper. Indeed. And you take it across the top, a fold like that. Oh, right? I do, yeah. Then you yeah. open that and then you cross it over on the other side. Some people will probably be aware of this design because I think it's yeah. been around a while now. Yeah. So you basically do that the other way. Yeah. And then you, you've got these creases and you fold them in to square off the nose or point the nose, yeah. right? Yep. Which won't stay pointy. So you, you end up with that, right? Yes. Then you fold up the edges. Ah, uh, that's right, yeah. Like so. And you do it again, don't you? No. That's oh, how you make you? that magic box thing. All right. Then, <laughs> you just, then you just fold it all in. It sort of gives it a, a bit of bulk at the front. That's right, to give you the... the and then you the fold back the, the, the point to square off the nose, which I know doesn't sound aerodynamically brilliant, but so you end up with that. Oh, uh, yeah. This is yep. a very rudimentary effort because I'm doing it without much decisions. But, but then you fold <laughs> it up like that. You fold down the wings, one, two, and then you fold up the wing tips just to give it a bit of um, trim. Mm -hmm. And you end up with... That kind of look. Look at that. Ooh, yeah. And that's then you snazzy. just, you, it needs a tail. And if you want to put trim tabs on it or aileron, yeah, ele elevators and then ailerons, you can do yeah. that. I never bother. And that's that's it. So that's sort what he flew. Up. Yeah. That's what he flew around the classroom. And they usually, I'll try and fly it to the back okay. of the room. They usually fly really well. Yeah. 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 Pretty good. Bit nose heavy there, but <laughs> I probably needed more velocity. Yeah, because <laughs> they do they do like to be chucked those ones, but uh, yeah. my grandchildren love them. Every time they yeah. come up, make 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 me play, make me play. Very good. Uh, yeah, see a little bit of bonus footage for our live viewers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you want me to draw the design and send it to you, no, not going to happen. No, I wouldn't know. Wouldn't know just, how to do just that. Just replay the YouTube and you'll find yeah. out how to do it. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm I demonstrated it very well.